Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Ask a Leader track called Running Your Co-op, the Financial Health and Performance of BECU. If you're looking for a different session or topic, please use the track buttons below to navigate throughout the event. I'm Jenny Fancher, Senior Vice President of Enterprise Strategic Services here at BECU, and I have the pleasure of being the moderator for this session. Today, we're joined by three of BECU's most senior leaders who each play a critical role in maintaining the financial health and performance of BECU. We'll start with introductions. I will ask each of our hosts to introduce themselves and share a bit about their areas of focus, and then we'll take some questions. You can use the chat feature on the right side of the page to submit a question. We'll answer as many as we can during the time we have. So let's get started with introductions and areas of focus. Benson, can I ask you to lead us off? Sure. Thanks, Jenny. Um, hi, I'm Benson Porter, the President and CEO at BCU. I've been with the organization for nine years, and I'll pass the mic to Melba. Thank you, Benson. I'm Melba Bartels. I'm Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. I just recently celebrated my fourth year anniversary with BECU, and I oversee all aspects of BECU's financial strategy, management, and performance. John, how about you? Thanks, Melba. I'm John Stewart, and my title is EVP and Chief Risk Officer. I've been with BECU five years, and I lead the legal governance, risk, and compliance functions. Uh, back to you, Jenny. Thank you for that. So earlier this afternoon, uh, Benson and Melba shared a compelling overview of 2020 during the State of the Credit Union. It was quite a year, as I'm sure everyone on the call can agree. Despite the environment, I personally marveled every day at how our teams came together to support one another and our members. And our list of accomplishments is long. I'd like to ask the three of you to share a highlight or two, something that really stands out for you or that you're especially proud of for, from 2020. Benson, why don't you start us off? Sure, Jenny, thanks. And without repeating what we what we said in the opening remarks, um, I, I was most struck by how our teams reacted. Um, I think that the teams are the secret sauce and the people at BCU and how they reacted to the pandemic is really what I, I, I find most notable and um, modifying over 26,000 loans, bringing out products in the matter of days, a income inter interruption loan, the SBA PPP program, just how the teams came together and worked through a lot of adversity, uh, new work environments for a lot to transition to working remotely from, from home. And our frontline teams uh, continue to keep our offices open to serve our members. So just a, a lot of respect for how our teams have responded. Thanks, Benson. Uh, yeah, great question. You know, looking back on 2020, I have to say I'm just really gratified that we were able to support all of our constituents through what was an extremely challenging time for all of us. We entered the pandemic in a strong financial position, which enabled us to support our employees, our members, and our communities in really meaningful ways through an extremely difficult year. And that included offering our consumer and our business members a range of financial relief, relief options, which were very, very important last year. Um, and the fact that we entered into 2020 uh, in a strong financial position was not by luck. Um, it was actually by design. It was the result of careful capital management planning. And it is in fact due to this planning that allowed us to support strong value to our members in the form of uh, return to member or RTM, despite the fact that we had a decline in our net income during the year. I'd be remiss if I wouldn't say, if I didn't say that I'm also just extremely proud and grateful for all of our BECU team members. They worked tirelessly as we navigated a constantly evolving environment throughout the year. The planning and the adjustments that were made over the course of the year helped us to avoid any drastic measures, and we entered into 2021 in a solid financial position because of it. John, how about you? What were your standouts for last year? Yeah, thank, thanks, Melba. So building on what's already been said, I would say my first highlight is, is some aspects of our pandemic response. So the speed at which we were able to adjust our operations to keep employees and members safe, I, I think was pretty remarkable, especially considering sort of how quickly the environment was changing and the dynamic guidance from local, state, and federal health officials. And that wasn't by chance. I think our, our values helped us keep health and safety front and center throughout the changes and our advanced planning through years of business continuity planning helped us respond quickly. 
So some examples of this. So we changed how we interacted with members in our neighborhood financial centers to increase distancing and make it more safe. And we pretty quickly transitioned our back office employees to primarily working from home without without interruption in service. Uh, and a big part of that, of that pandemic response was also member support. So as noted earlier, as you or as you may have seen in the video, uh, we were very quickly we were very quick to do, to deploy a member support lending product, so a zero percent loan that provided relief. And we also provided loan payment relief to over 20,000 members in a very short period of time. It was a very effective program. Uh, another highlight for me from last year is sort of the energy and the focus we put towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've had a lot of internal training and development leading to a very intentional focus in multiple areas. So it ranges from modifying our hiring processes in some cases, planning changes to our procurement process or defining a member code of conduct that's pretty unique in the industry and helps set the tone for an inclusive environment. So th those are a couple, a couple of the highlights for me. So with that, back to you, Jenny. Wonderful, thanks. Thanks for sharing that, everyone. Um, definitely a lot, um, a lot of accomplishments, but let's switch gears and, and turn to 2021. Um, what are you all most excited about this year? Melba, I'll ask you to go first this time. All right. Thanks, Jenny. Well, I have to say I'm excited for us to return to some level of normalcy this year. I think we're all feeling pretty good about starting to see some positive signs with things heading in the right direction, but certainly a full recovery to pre-pandemic levels for the economy and for BECU will likely take the better part of this year, if not longer. My focus in 2021 will be to help ensure that we continue to navigate to a full recovery and continue to support the financial health of the credit union, our members, and our communities. John, how about you? Yes, yeah, so I, I think we feel really good about our, our cybersecurity program, so our ability to protect our members' data. And we think over the course of the next year, the program is gonna get even stronger. So the behind the, the, the behind the scenes work in cybersecurity, it's not always glamorous. So network architecture, minimizing the footprint of sensitive data, uh, multi-factor authentication, and a lot of internal training. But these, these steps really help to make sure that our members' data is extremely secure. And then second, and probably similar to Melba, it's helping our members transition through what is hopefully the final stages of the pandemic with programs like SBA PPP, so the program is still ongoing, but I think the major phase left is really that that forgiveness process. And then we have the ongoing loan payment relief products. So we're planning for a seamless transition in this. So as we transition kind of back to, for some of our employees working from an office environment, as we transition to this post-pandemic world, we think that's all gonna be seamless for the membership. But like Melba, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to uh, exiting this environment. So with that, Benson, I'll hand it back to you. Great, thanks, John. And uh, it's, it's hard to add to what you two have already already said. Um, you know, like like everyone, there's there's hope that we'll be able to have some return back to the office uh, here later this year for some of our support teams. And so we'll obviously see how things play out and hopefully start to move towards um, some of our employees who uh, um, who, who want to be back and, and be able to collaborate in person, be able to do that. So that that's that's a hopeful highlight that that we we'll have to look forward to this year. And in terms of the last several years, we've been on a continuous path of improving our digital tools. Obviously, those became very critical during the pandemic when more of our members shifted it to accessing their money and managing their money through online banking and the mobile app. And so we'll continue this coming year, those investments in, into our digital capabilities, both to improve our employees' experience and supporting our members, and also the functionality that our members can accomplish on our digital tools. And I know we have some things in the pipeline to continue to build upon new savings tools, like we added last year, Save Up and a Quick Save. Uh, we have an envelopes uh, product that we think will make it easier for members to kind of set aside money for some of their savings goals. So we're excited to get that launched this coming year. So Jenny, back to you. Great, thanks for sharing those insights. Um, thank you, Melba, John, and Benson. Um, we'll use our remaining time to answer any questions. Um, I would now like to introduce my colleague, Sean, who is going to help me out. Please remember that you can submit a question via the chat button on the right side of your page. 
we do have some questions that were submitted leading up to this event and also that came in during the state of the credit union presentation. Quite a few that have come in just now, I understand. So let's get started. Sean, what is our first question? All right. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you again to our members for writing in those questions. It's all about you. So the first question here is saying a few people have asked about the credit card and deposit rate adjustments in 2020. We want to know what they can expect in 2021. That's a great question. Uh, Melba, I would like to ask you, you to take that one. Absolutely, Jenny. So, um, and it is, it is a great question. And as you might expect, we will continue to monitor the economic recovery and we will adjust as needed to changes in the interest rate environment, while at the same time continuing to ensure that we're supporting a strong level of value for our members. There are really uh, two key things that helped enable our ability to support return to member in 2020. And that was a strong capital position, as I mentioned earlier, as well as disciplined expense management. And we will continue to look to both of these in 2021, ensuring the credit union's health, while at the same time supporting our members' financial health. Wonderful, thank you for that. Sean, what do we have next? All right, this is from David F. This is on the main page and David writes in, how did BCU manage to stay open in those early days of the pandemic when so many retailers couldn't? There was a big effort that took um, employees from all across the credit union to figure out and then and then execute on. Um, who would like to take that? I think everybody across the credit union played a role in that, Benson. Well, I'll just jump in to, to offer that um, it did take a, a really a team effort across the organization. And we, we were very intentional about trying to follow all the public health announcements that came out. And as folks recall, those were coming out fairly frequently and sometimes there was some inconsistency. Um, and it really our hats go off to really our frontline teams that really helped um, support millions of transactions for our members. We had over a million visits to our branches during the pandemic. We had multiple of that in terms of calls to the contact center. It was really just some extraordinary individual efforts. And I remember hearing some stories about employees that were concerned about coming home when uncertainty of how the virus was spread so they would sleep in their cars so they would be able to support members the next day at our offices. So this really just some tremendous stories and heroics that we hopefully we never have to, to go through again because it, it really was above and beyond type, type of situations. And it, Benson, if I if I could, I would just add that kind of we see and our regulators see us as providing a critical service. So it's really important that we, we try to stay open when we can. So if our members need cash, going into an NFC, if they have a complex transaction or speaking to somebody in a, in a contact center, we, we really need to be there for them. So we had a strong motivation to do our best to stay open as well. Yeah, John, as I recall, the terms of art were um, we were essential services from kind of the government's eyes. And then when it came around to the vaccine distribution, uh, a higher standard was put in place of critical, which you know, obviously some of the healthcare and other critical professions. Uh, so uh, we, we didn't get any extra treatment there. And we've really, we're quite proud that we we're able to stay open and serve our members. I think we had, I think it was 1.3 million visits to our branches or during the pandemic period. And we're not aware of any transmission that occurred uh, between our members and our staff throughout that period, which is something that, which is really quite extraordinary. Great. Thank you for that question. That was a wonderful question. Uh, Sean, what do we have All right. next? This one comes in. This is back from the community relations inbox, so people can write in there. I saw BCU added to its reserves for loan losses in 2020. Has BCU experienced a significant increase in credit losses because of the pandemic, or do you anticipate an increase in the future? Yeah, yeah that, that's a great question. And that that's right. So as we were anticipating in 2020, a, a pretty challenging macroeconomic environment. So the, the, the economy that we're working in, we did add to our, our loan losses that, that absorb losses for, for loans. So credit losses on loans. So we added to that last year and we really, we've been pulling back uh, as we get into 2021 and the outlook gets more clear. So the combination of the very effective member support programs, and especially that loan payment relief program, which was just a massive scale. That was an extremely effective program. That combined with the, the effectiveness of the federal stimulus programs has really made this so it hasn't been a, a credit loss event at all. So we anticipate something pretty benign, something very sustainable, something that 
a level of credit loss that looks like the pre-pandemic period even. So we're, we're anticipating releasing substantially all of those reserves over time, yeah. Thank you, great question. And John, Sean, I, 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 oh. well, I was just gonna, just, gonna just, just add a little bit that, uh, you know, John, I think that's exactly right. We didn't see the credit losses, whether it was delinquency or charge off materialized in really any of our portfolios. Well, but what we also saw is the financial balance sheet of our members it looks like it generally improved uh, with uh, the decline in spending and an increase in savings. And so while I won't say people are better off, uh, we did see some improvement in the health of our members' financial situations through the pandemic, which I think probably was a little bit of a surprise. And it was probably a testament to the relief efforts that we tried to take for our borrowers and also some of the stimulus that was provided that John mentioned. Great, thanks. Thanks for that, Benson, I agree. All right, Sean. Okay, this one came in from the State of the Credit Union, kicked off the event this evening. What do you mean by sustainable growth? Good question. Melba, I know this is top of mind for you. Would you like to take this one? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a terrific question. Sustainable growth is one of our four strategic pillars and focus areas at BECU. And it speaks not only to the balance between growth and profitability, but also investing in our infrastructure. Um, people, processes, and systems to ensure that our operations can effectively and efficiently support that growth. So strong operations coupled with solid financial footing are really the foundation that are required to support our members and provide value not only in the near term, but over the long term. And so that's really what we mean about sustainable growth. Terrific question. Great. All right, Sean. Okay, let's go to a question came earlier as we talk about the community relations inbox from our members. Uh, given BCU's current and projected growth, how is the company retaining the small credit union member focused culture? That's a great question and very particularly important to BECU. Benson, Benson mentioned the secret sauce here at BECU earlier. Do you want to opine on that, Benson? Sure, I'm happy to, to, to jump in on this. Um, that's something that we have really thought a lot about as particularly as we've worked in a remote environment for a lot of our support teams is are we able to maintain kind of the BECU secret sauce of the culture that's been very member centric and uh, uh, really orient orients around our members and doing the right thing for our membership. Um, that's why I think we're excited that hopefully there is a light at the end of this tunnel and that while I think we have sustained our culture in this kind of remote environment, um, it's all unknown to us in terms of how as we're welcoming new employees to the organization, how well can we continue to build upon and continue to um, evolve that culture over time. So um, a little bit of in-person will hopefully be, 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 be additive to that. Um, another way we think about um, continuing our credit reunion roots is that when we did a commitment this year for our, our uh, Black Community Development Fund, we uh, particularly earmarked a portion of that funding to really support the credit union space and some of um, institutions within the credit union space that work within the uh, underserved communities. So I, I think there's, you know, in addition to kind of where our culture is and staying oriented there as, as we continue to grow and expand. And Melvin really talked about the importance of that because we can't go out and raise capital like some of our bank competitors. Instead, we have to generate it from within. And the more membership that we have, we're able to spread the cost of running your cooperative and investments that we want to make for you in the digital channels uh, among a, a broader base. So that, that's, that's why the sustainable growth is important to really be able to uh, really run this uh, organization as efficiently and good stewards of your money. Yeah, and I, you know, I might just add with respect to culture, um, I'm not sure that size is necessarily the determinant in terms of culture and, and what we think of as the, the secret sauce for BECU, Jenny, as you mentioned. Um, to me, it's really more about our purpose and the authenticity of our purpose, which is to support our members' financial health and how that alignment um, toward that purpose of the entire team really helps to um, align the entire organization and support our culture at any size. Wonderful. Thank you. Sean, what do we have? Next? Okay. The inbox is cooking. Here we go. Okay. A consumer, <laughs> as a consumer financial cooperative, how does BCU interact with other credit unions and co-ops? 
That's a good question. Benson, I wonder if I can ask you to answer this question. I know you're very involved um, with various credit union organizations, as well as keeping frequent contact with a number of CEOs. Sure. There are um, um, some fundamental credit union principles, and one of which is cooperation among cooperatives. And so the credit unions tend to share a lot of information amongst themselves. We participate in um, organizations where we allow shared branching and shared ATM use. And so all these organizations are opportunities for credit unions to support one another. And we also look at some of our community development financial institution credit unions and, and put low cost deposits or loans to, to help support uh, some of these organizations. So so there is a number of ways that we participate within the industry, both in terms of some of these shared services, but also in terms of supporting some of the uh, institutions that support some of the uh, uh, more challenging uh, parts of our economy. I know John, John also heads up our uh, uh, government relations team that does a lot of coordination with, uh, with the other credit unions. Any, anything you like to add? Uh, yeah, so we will coordinate on on public policy issues, especially if it's something impactful to financial services and credit unions. So, so we work with uh, I don't know trade associations really aligned to credit union interests. So we'll coordinate in those forums, and then we'll also coordinate kind of more informally. So, I one thing that's really great about working at a cooperative is I can kind of reach out to my counterparts at other credit unions and share ideas and because we're, we're really not competitors uh, in the same way that so, some other financial institutions might be. But yeah, on, on the government relations front, we, we actually kind of, we link arms very tightly and, and try to collaborate closely. Thanks for that insight. Sean. Okay, back to our members here. And this one comes to the inbox from Cherie. Oh, Cherie, I hope I pronounced that right. Please forgive me. Uh, ask this question here. What new member benefits are coming soon? That's a great question. I think probably and everybody on the panel might have some insight there. Who'd like to take this one? Well, I think I mentioned in my, what I'm looking forward to is that we've um, um, implemented some new savings products this past year. Some were implemented, some were piloted. We expect to implement piloted items this year along with some additional savings features because we recognize the importance of, of building that nest egg uh, and in terms of uh, uh, building the financial resiliency of the personal household. And so we're trying to have as many fun and easy tools um, through the digital channel to help help our members save. And some of these tools, I think we raised over $5 million of additional savings for our members and with some of these tools this past year. So we're hopeful that uh, rolling those out this year will, uh, will, will be a great, great addition. Wonderful. It's become increasingly important for our members to be able to access their um, funds and do their banking transactions uh, electronically. And so I think we have a lot of things to look forward to there as well. Jenny, as part of your role in, in running our enterprise projects, you probably have the status of, uh, we have lots of small business members now uh, approaching 60,000. And we have a, a online banking system enhancements for our, our small business members that are on, on schedule for this year for implementation. So I think that's that's still in the plan, correct? That's right. That's right. That's another big one. And I think that our business members um, will really appreciate having the full functionality of a business online banking system soon. Yeah. All right, Sean, sure. what's next? Okay. So this question kind of touches on a little bit what we were talking about here earlier this evening, but you mentioned adjustments that were made to keep the credit union financially sound in a difficult year that we've had 2020. There were some changes to credit card and deposit interest rates. What else can we expect for 2021? Good question. Um, Melba, do you want to start us off with this one? Sure. Um, you know, similar to uh, a question previously, I think, you know, what, what you can expect is we will continue to monitor the environment as it, as it continues to change. Um, uh, you know, not as rapidly as it changed last year, but uh, nonetheless, there's still a level of uncertainty in terms of um, the environment. So we'll continue to monitor that very, very closely. Um, and we'll make adjustments as needed. Um, and those adjustments could, of course, go, you know, in, in multiple different directions. But the key is, is that as we look to make adjustments uh, as needed, we will be, again, looking to balance, create that right balance in terms of member value and the sustainability of, of the credit union um, and all, all of our key constituents, whether it be um, our members, our employees and our communities. Hey, Melba, this thought of may, may might be helpful to mention, you know, 
what we look at in terms of what we're trying to drive the organization towards is we make these rate decisions. I think that everyone can recognize the low rate environment is obviously challenging for our members that are our savers, but it's it's beneficial to our to our members that are that are borrowers. And so we attempt to think about that and balance. And so a couple of the measures that we look at uh, pretty constantly is net promoter score in terms of what's our service and experience of our members and would they recommend BCU to their friends and family members. That's one of our North Star measures that we, we try to move towards as we make these decisions. And the other uh, Melba had mentioned is return to member. We want to make sure we're offering good value to our members. Um, and so that goes across both deposit and lending. And so we, we look towards trying to uh, provide a sustainable return to member, which Melba mentioned was uh, close to, to 300 million uh, this year, just, o- just over and about $300 per member. So those are kind of our guiding measures as we make these decisions. While we can't predict what the decision will be this year, those will be the measures that we're looking at. Are our members pleased with our experience and what, what's the direction of that? And then are, are we delivering value compared to, to the competitors where our members could go? That's right, Benson. And maybe just to add on to that, you know, you mentioned deposit rates and loan rates and, and um, looking at the bank averages and ensuring that we're, we're providing better value there. Another really big component of our return to member and the value that we provide is, is in low to no fees. And so in particular, last year, as we, as we knew that we had members that were struggling with payments, um, we eliminated all late fees associated with um, with loan payments and so that's just a great example of you know how we will continue to monitor the situation help to un- un- ensure that we understand where our members are where the where the need is the greatest um, and so we can adapt to that great thank you Melba and Benson Sean I think we probably have time for a couple more questions Okay, good, because we do have one more. So that's great. That works out. So this one kind of touches on what we were discussing earlier with the stimulus programs and the support for it. So it says uh, here, I saw BCU added to its reserves for loan losses in 2020, as we discussed. Has BCU experienced a significant increase in credit losses because of the pandemic, or do you anticipate an increase in the future? Go ahead, John. You want to continue yeah. on? Yeah, just kind of similar. So we, we, we did add to our, our reserves sort of recognizing that the environment was pretty uncertain. Uh, some of the indicators were, were worrisome in, in 2020, especially. The outlook has really improved. So for lending, the, the effectiveness of our loan payment relief uh, programs combined with the federal stimulus and then the, the improvement in the broader economy, those have really kind of brightened our outlook. So we're not anticipating any, any real credit event associated with the pandemic. Our performance is really pretty similar to pre-pandemic levels, so we'll be kind of reducing those those levels of reserves over time without having really tapped into them. Was there any impact of the PPP loan program that was different than you were expecting or different than BECU uh, normal course of business? You know, for me, I was I was surprised at kind of the the range of size of businesses that, that took advantage of the PPP program. So I think for us, it was about 165 million in PPP loans extended. I, I can't recall the exact number of, of businesses that we, we supported, but I don't know, over 10,000 jobs supported in the broader economy. But I think the average loan size for us ended up much smaller than, than I, w- I was kind of reading in the broader press. So we were really able to, to support some of the smallest businesses in our community with the PPP program. That was, that was one insight for me. Uh, and then I, I am looking forward to kind of that forgiveness process, which is coming up for most of those businesses in the near future. Yeah, John, I think there were some outlier uh, press articles about some large PPP loans that were done. And there was a question about whether or not that was the original target. I think we were pretty comfortable that most of the uh, loans we did, I think the average size was sub $30,000, about $28,000 was, was, the, was the average size of our PPP loan. So we felt like it really did go to the small business. And I think that the figure was we, we helped save about 11,000 local jobs through the loans that we were able to do. I think what was most probably learning from that is, is the, you know, the government created a new program. We had to gear up, I think, 100 employees from across our organization kind of band together to help turn, get that program out to our members as quick as we could, is that we were concerned that the windows would close in funding 
uh, and we wouldn't be able to get to all our members. And I think we ultimately did. And then when the PPP was renewed, uh, I think we more than were able to serve our current members. We actually were able to welcome some new members that were seeking funding that they didn't get elsewhere. So I think we felt good, but it was unclear at the beginning and there was a mad scramble. It was also hard to tell what was a, a firm pi pipeline because a lot of small businesses were looking for the loan and they would apply to multiple institutions hoping to get, you know, be able to get it. And so it was hard to tell uh, if they were able to get it from somewhere else or with us. And so those were a lot of operational issues that we had to work through, but we under understood it wasn't the member's fault. We were all learning as we were going. Yeah, I, I just, I, I think that could have been in our highlights from last year, just that Vince had mentioned it, that when many employees in different functions across BECU kind of raised their hand and said, yeah, I, I'd like to jump in and help, help these people kind of keep their jobs, help with the PPP program. That was certainly a highlight of last year for me. I would agree. That was impressive to observe. Sean, I think we have time for one more question. And it did just come in. So for that member, we've got you. Here you go. Last one, <laughs> drum roll. Uh, asking just how financially stable is BCU compared to other banks or credit unions? Is my money safe? Great question. Probably top of mind for many. So Melba, can I ask you to take that one? Absolutely. You know, I, I think I mentioned earlier that we entered 2020 in a really uh, strong position. And and one of the key metrics that we track in order to determine our financial soundness is our net worth ratio. If you had a chance to watch the recording that was that started off the Member Summit show, you, you will have seen some details on that. Um, but just to give you some perspective on that ratio, in order to be considered well capitalized by our regulatory body, which is the um, NCUA, National Credit Union Association, uh, administration, sorry, um, we have to have a 7% uh, capital ratio and BECU while we were down um, modestly in the year from 2019 to 2020 we ended 2020 at over 10 percent in terms of our capital ratio uh, so we ended the year strong we started uh, the year uh, this year strong and we expect to be able to add to that capital position over the course of this year as well. So Melvin, maybe it's helpful to talk about absolute terms. We talk about percentages and sometimes it's kind of hard to track all of it. I think in your video, you had a really great graphic where you said the federal regulators uh, require a 7% net worth ratio in order to be considered well capitalized. We ended the year a little over 10%. So we feel like there's a, a good buffer there for, for uncertainty. And that's really what the, the capital ratio helps serve for. If you look at our asset size of approximately $28 billion, 10% capital means we have about 2.8 billion in capital for, for rainy day. And obviously we need to keep a minimum level, but there is there is some cushion there. We are very conscious to managing and being good stewards of your money for, for the long term. That's right, it all goes back to that sustainable growth, right? Well, so I think that that wraps up this session. Um, if your question wasn't addressed or if you have follow on questions and you didn't have a chance to submit them, please email them to communityrelations at becu.org. I believe somebody is gonna put that in the chat line so that you can write that down, but it's all one, one word, communityrelations at becu.org. Please feel free to submit your questions and we'll be sure that we get them answered and, and sent back to you. So thank you all for attending and spending some time this afternoon with us. Thank you very much to Benson and John and Melba for um, entertaining these questions and spending some time with us and sharing your thoughts. Really appreciate it. There is a survey below. You can find it by scrolling down the page. Please take a moment to give us your feedback on this session. We would really like to hear, hear whatever um, feedback that you have for us. With that, I'm going to go ahead and end this session. Thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank Thanks. you. ECU makes a great effort in supporting the employees and uh, the activities that 
are of importance to us. Giving back to our community is very important to all of us here at BECU to the point that we've created a program titled BECU Cares and one of the greatest elements of the BECU Cares program is we give each employee 24 hours annually to give back to programs and nonprofits that matter to them. What's better than you know getting paid to do what you're passionate about and helping people? The role at BCU allowed me to give back by giving me the opportunity to volunteer at Tequila Food Bank, uh, where I able to partner with a different people to uh, prep for the food and then give back to all the people who need it. Uh, I remember it was on a Thursday morning, and I did not know that it was a long line for over 300 people line up to receive food from us. And able to see that, able to realize that how people needed it, uh, give me a thought about I want to do more and more. And BCU still able to offer me to volunteer more and more. So that's what I'm really proud of. Annual day of service, which happens every year, where. Uh, the whole staff, the whole credit union closes for a day and we go out to high, local high schools and do uh, financial education. And it's just really cool to see uh, coworkers kind of break out of their shell, be put in different environment, a different social environment that might be challenging or new, and then to come to work the next day and hear all about it. And everyone always has a big smile on their face. Really enjoy the chances that I get to teach people in one way or another. and. I really enjoy being able to fill in gaps of knowledge that people have. Whether it's a member and they don't know what their account can do and I can tell them, oh, and you can do this and that with it and there's these extra pieces and here's how you can build your credit rating up using this at no cost to you. So my favorite memory would be when I held a almost an 80 year old member who had never gone to the ATM and she was standing in the teller line wanting to make a deposit. And I asked her, what are you doing today? And she said, I'm just making a deposit. I said, I can help you with that at the ATM. She goes, I've never used that ATM and I don't want to use it. I've never used it, I'm not comfortable. I said, do you mind if I take you over there and show you how you, know, you can make that deposit? So she said, okay. So I took her to the ATM, we made the deposit, and she was like so happy. She said, you t taught me something new today. Sharing my knowledge, sharing, um you know, my passion uh, of helping people. There is so much that we can do in order to help fulfill a need, and it really is just on trying to dig as deep as we can in order to find what those are. So that can separate us different from any other financial institution because we're not just hitting numbers, we're fulfilling people's dreams.